I rise today, Madam President, to urge us here in the United States Senate to seize an opportunity that's critically important to our nation's economic recovery and our long-term energy future. By establishing a national renewable electricity standard, which is known in the industry as an RES, we will without a doubt, without a doubt, spur a new clean energy economy. Many of my colleagues here in the United States uh, Senate agree with me. My colleague from Kansas uh, has been a leader on the need for a renewable electricity standard. And just this week, he's made a call uh, to all of us to join him uh, in promoting one. Uh, let me also specifically thank uh, Senator Dorgan from North Dakota and Senator Tom Udall from, ne from New Mexico for joining me to urge adoption of a strong federal RES. Uh, establishing energy security, perhaps above any other issue, will assure our nation's future success. Quite simply, a 21st century clean energy policy is instrumental to our nation's economic growth. It's a foundation for creating jobs now and into the future, and it's clearly the linchpin to our national security. The philosopher George Santayana famously wrote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And Madam President, if I can turn that uh, saying on its head a bit, I'd like to review what happened in Colorado in the hopes that we can repeat it across our great country. Back in 2004, Colorado took a big, brave step forward and embraced the emerging clean energy economy. And in that year, I led a bipartisan ballot initiative with our former Republican, or I should say Republican former speaker uh, of this Colorado House, uh, Lola Spradley, in a campaign to convince our voters in Colorado to approve a state-based RES that would harness renewable resources like the sun, the wind, the heat that comes out of the earth called geothermal. Uh, and we barnstormed the state over and over again, the two of us, a Republican and a Democrat. We spoke to anybody who would listen to us. There was a lot of industry opposition to an RES, and there were dire predictions uh, that it would cost consumers money and it would damage Colorado's economy. Uh, they were familiar arguments. I'd heard them before, and I'd witnessed defeat on this issue before. The Colorado legislature had voted against an RES four different times, including uh, my bill back in 1997 to establish an RES when I was a member of the Colorado House. We couldn't convince elected officials to vote for an RES at the State House and in our State Senate, but Colorado voters understood the value and the promise of renewable energy. And in the end, in that campaign in 2004, they approved what we called Amendment 37 and established a target that 10 percent of Colorado's electricity would come from renewable energy resources by 2015. And so doing, Madam President, we became the first state to create an RES by a voter-passed initiative. This clearly defined goal, this clean energy goal, inspired us, Coloradans, to rise to the challenge. And in just three years, now we had given ourselves over 10 years to meet this uh, challenge. We were on pace uh, to meet that 10 percent RES goal, and we were well ahead of schedule. Our legislature saw this rapid success, and they decided to really take the bull by the horns. Uh, they improved and increased to 20% by 2020, which was another uh, aggressive but a reachable goal. And by that time, XL Energy, I know the presiding officer and I talked earlier today about utilities and the important role they play in our states. XL Energy, which is a major Colorado utility, had opposed the RES in 2004 but they fully supported this increase to 20% by 2020 because they saw that renewable energy sources could provide clean, cost-effective energy to their customers. And by the way, it turned out it was really good uh, for business. XL is now the nation's number one provider of wind energy and a leading proponent of a strong RES. But Madam President, we weren't done. Earlier this year, the Colorado legislature approved and our governor, Bill Ritter, signed a bill to increase the RES even further, 30% by 2020. That makes our standard, our RES, the second most aggressive one in the nation, just behind uh, California. Uh, now, I put up a chart here to show uh, the viewers how many states have renewable electricity standards. I see the presiding officer's home state right there uh, down in the lower left corner. Over two-thirds of the states have an RES or a renewable energy goal. And I think, and I know, if we here in Congress can act and th well, start by thinking boldly and then act and learn from the success of our state and all the other states on this map, our nation can position itself to take the lead in the no new global clean energy economy. Now, I know some still want to look backward instead of forward 
and continue to offer dire predictions that an RES would cost consumers, be too expensive, or kill jobs. But I have to tell you, in Colorado, those predictions turned out simply to be false. In fact, just the opposite was proven true. With an RES in place, our economy, our clean energy economy, is sparked to life. Uh, we've had clean energy companies sprouting up all across our state, creating sustainable American jobs, jobs that can't be outsourced. And I wanted to share a couple of the examples uh, with the Senate. Uh, SMA Solar, which is one of the world's leading producers of solar inverters, established manufacturing facilities uh, in Colorado. Abound Solar, which is a successful thin film solar company spun out of Colorado State University, our land grant uh, university, opened a manufacturing facility in Longmont, Colorado, creating hundreds of jobs in that community. And just this month, they announced they were going to expand their facility. Vestas, the world's largest manufacturer of wind turbines, also has taken root in our great state and has created over 1,000 highly skilled manufacturing jobs at its three Colorado factories since just 2007. And they, they recently announced a major hiring initiative to employ hundreds of additional workers at its three Colorado factories in the next 12 to 18 months. The, Good news as well is that the presence of a company like Vestas, which is manufacturing, means that you then attract supply chain businesses. An example of such a business is XL Corporation. They've established a manufacturing facility in Windsor, a nice Colorado town up in the northeastern part of our state, and they produce carbon factor and other components for Vestas right uh, in our backyard. So, Madam. President, as you can tell, these are clear examples of how an RES can create jobs and growth in our economy. And in fact, if you look at the numbers uh, in Colorado, we've created nearly 20,000 uh, new jobs in my state since 2004 tied to this RES. Estimates about the solar energy requirement, that's a subset of, of Amendment 37, have brought in nearly 1,500 jobs. So we're aggressively installing solar panels and producing electricity uh, on the roofs of people's homes and businesses. So they're just, they're, uh, these stories abound uh, all over uh, Colorado. So in my mind, the question then becomes, um, and it's an obvious one, how can we replicate the success that Colorado's had on our national level? It obviously helps to be blessed with the natural resources that we have in, in our state. Now, all of our states are created differently with different resources. And I know uh, this particularly, I think, lands in front of my colleague, that uh, my colleagues in the South are tracking uh, this issue very closely uh, for that reason. They're, they have concerns that their states do not have enough renewable energy resources to meet a national RES without electricity prices increasing. And uh, I wanted to share with uh, my colleagues that a report released just this week by the Nicholas Institute at Duke University found that the South has more renewable resources than expected and could reasonably receive 15% of its electricity from wind, biomass, and solar energy by 2020, and without, without an increase uh, in electricity costs. Now, I know this is just one study, uh, but as we've seen in Colorado, renewable resources are only one part of the equation. Once there's a market in place, and our utilities become familiar with renewable energy, meeting an RES becomes increasingly achievable. And in fact, recent analysis indicates that wind, geothermal, and biomass are already cost competitive with traditional electricity production. So Madam President, what that results in in many situations is the costs ac across the country then are leavened uh, and it affects uh, each and every one of our utilities and therefore consumer uh, rates. So we can change how we generate and approach energy use to take full advantage of renewable energy resources in each of our states and then we create new markets and business opportunities out of this clean energy focus. And that truly is a clean energy future. So this is an enormous economic opportunity for us in the 21st century. The global demand for clean energy is growing by one trillion, it's almost a number I can't get in my head, one trillion dollars every year. And the lesson uh, to be learned from Colorado is that an effective RES, a real RES, can unleash the American entrepreneurial spirit. And I believe it's our job in the Senate to pursue these sorts of forward-looking policies that will help America seize and lead this growing market. So again, I just want to urge my colleagues to support the strongest possible RES 
in any energy legislation that is brought to the floor this year. Now, I've alluded to the hesitation that some of my colleagues have felt about a robust RES. I, I saw that in Colorado firsthand for many years. It's tempting to just dip your toe uh, into the water when it comes to renewable energy. But make no mistake, we're in a race against foreign competitors. And we're being, being, being left behind. Uh, the presiding officer and I uh, just recently returned from China, uh, and where we discussed clean energy issues with American businesses located there. And China, we found out, will soon be the owners of the largest wind and solar power facilities. They're pursuing renewable energy and clean energy technology so ambitiously, not because they necessarily want to save the planet, but because it makes good business and economic sense. And just this week, we heard that China's energy use has surpassed ours for the very first time. But I have to tell you, in my opinion, from what I read and hear, they're taking more bold action to address their growing demand than we are. And then they also announced last week that they're considering plans to invest $738 billion over the next 10 years in clean energy development. That's nearly the size, the entire size of our Recovery Act that we put in place last year in the United States. So just imagine, their economy is using a comparable amount of energy, but they take clean energy so seriously that they plan to invest a stimulus-sized amount of money solely in renewables. I saw it firsthand, and uh, to use a well-worn term, I th they're about ready to eat our lunch when it comes uh, to clean energy. Madam President, I don't want to miss this historic opportunity to implement a strong RES. So let me take a few more minutes to explain what standard uh, I believe we must meet. I want to put a chart up here to show what the different levels of, of uh, percentages would mean for job creation. When you set a standard, you want to set it at a level uh, that you can be proud of and one that would spur innovation and the creativity to achieve it. Uh, Senator Tom Udall and I filed a bill last year in the Senate, which had previously passed in the House where we served, mandating an RES of 25 percent of renewable electricity by 2025. And that's this side of the chart uh, here. Senator Dorgan has uh, recommended a, a similarly aggressive standard. So why is it important to aim for these ambitious levels? Well, looking again at the chart, if we were to invest uh, wisely in a robust RES, a recent Navigant report estimates that the U.S. economy could add nearly 275,000 jobs. These are excellent paying jobs. They can't be outsourced, and they support this concept of energy independence. I just I can't think, Madam President, of a better deal uh, than this for Americans. Now, make no mistake about it, uh, our country must have an all-of-the-above energy policy. Conservation and energy efficiency efforts offer the quickest way to reduce energy demand today. Nuclear energy and natural gas can and should fill a larger share of our energy portfolio as they're both our cleaner fuels. And in addition, we all know that America is going to be dependent on fossil fuels for years to come. So all of these have to be in our, in our energy mix, and we have to acknowledge those facts in order to really embrace 21st century solutions. But when you look at the future demands for clean energy and the economic opportunities ahead of us, renewable energy holds the greatest promise. And the more homegrown renewable energy we can produce, the less money we need to spend buying oil from foreign nations who wish to do us harm or don't agree with our principles or values. I don't think anyone, I hope, I don't think anyone in this chamber can argue with the proposition that we should be moving aggressively towards energy independence. So as I begin to close, Madam President, it's time we make a concerted national effort to reclaim our position at the front of the pack. Many of the technologies the Chinese are utilizing, the Europeans are utilizing, and other nations around the world, we developed in the 70s and 80s. But we've got to get back to the front of the parade, where we harness the wind and the sun and other renewable resources here in America. And we put Americans to work developing, building, and leading the clean energy revolution. So I urge and ask uh, my colleagues to work with Senator Dorgan and Senator Udall of New Mexico and me and the many others that have joined us 
in this effort to have a strong renewable electricity standard. With all humility, let's follow Colorado's successful RES example, and let's adopt a clean energy policy that drives innovation, inspires entrepreneurs, and delivers common sense American solutions to meet our 21st century energy challenges. Madam President, I appreciate uh, your patience. I just want to close on, on a final note. I wanted to uh, acknowledge that a wonderful young man, and my energy fellow, Kelly Knutson, who's in the chamber right now, is leaving my office to join the office of Senator Reed of Rhode Island as a legislative assistant. I'd like to thank him for his work in my office, especially for his help on several bills I introduced this year, including my Sun Act and my Eno bill. Though we will miss him, uh, I know Kelly uh, will be a very strong asset for Senator Reed and Senator Reed's focus on energy policy as well. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, as I yield the floor, I note the absence of a quorum.